Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody boiled off 30 milliliters of liquid phosgene. I was in high school chemistry class, and we had a lab about burning magnesium. This involved burning a few small pieces of magnesium, lithium, and zinc ribbon slash foil in a Bunsen burner flame to view the atomic emission. We were all given glasses so that we wouldn't go blind, and we were told to keep them on the whole time. One girl decided to set a huge piece, like 4 inches folded on itself, on fire without her glasses on. She now has a permanent spot in her vision and went blind temporarily. It's really important not to look at really, really bright lights, and one of the brightest lights is burning magnesium. Another really common case where people can get permanent blind spots in their vision is from welding. So if you're ever doing welding, make sure that you wear a welding mask. And if you're ever burning anything that produces a lot of light, do not look directly at it. Look indirectly at it and wear goggles to protect your eyes. You might not realize that the amount of light that that type of reaction can output is so bright that it can just totally destroy parts of your eye. There's a reason why we don't stare at the sun. There's a reason why you shouldn't stare at any really bright light sources for too long. And that also includes chemical reactions. The bra incident reminds me. Many years ago, I acquired some scars on my neck, now largely faded, under my shirt collar. Had a little oopsie with some nitric acid, jumped in the shower with my clothes on, and removed my clothes. By the time I got my shirt off, there was some nasty-looking skin damage. In such situations, absorbent clothing is not your friend. No, I wasn't wearing a lab coat. Goggles, yes, and good thing, too. As it turned out, I didn't need to be using full-strength acid anyway. Diluting it a fair bit with water gave much better results for the task at hand, once I got back to it. I thought it would be fun if I made a chemistry meme for you guys, so here you go. Cubane is your crush. Bulvaline is her brother. Supercyclophane is her dad. Her ex is propylane. The guy that she tells you not to worry about is orthocarburane, and you're just benzene. We have the carbon tetrachloride funsies. How about some phenol now? One funny observation with phenol can be made in molecular biolab. We use a mixture of chloroform, phenol, and isoamyl alcohol in DNA-RNA extraction protocol. It forms an obvious two-phase system, with the phenol layer being the lower one, which is the part you're supposed to use in the protocol. Over the years, we have yet to see a student who does not instinctively shake it to mix it without even asking, which is exactly what they're not supposed to do. We have to keep a hidden second bottle of it in the fridge, just to have a well-separated one in case somebody does it again. It's not like the protocol won't work when you use the shaken mixture, but it's suboptimal in terms of yield and purity. And we keep phenol under the chloroform layer after mixing and saturation, because it preserves much better. Another semi yike story I can share is with preparing the phenol solution for this protocol. Pretty casual stuff. You just melt some phenol, wash it with the EDTA buffer a few times, and right into the freezer it goes to prepare the chloroform mixture later. We usually do a bunch at once because it's a pain, and the small batches take just as long as larger ones. Still not a lot, in the order of 500 to 1000 milliliters at most, which lasts for a few years. Anyway, for the separatory funnel mixing, the PI told me to make sure that the stopper fits the funnel, because there are some bad ones, and to stop and wash my hands and get a better stopper if I feel like it's getting wet. But thinking, nah, I have gloves, Ain't nobody got time for that. I just used a towel to hold the stopper end in case it'd get wet. Of course I picked a crappy one, and it had a tiny leak so it did get wet, but I couldn't feel it in the gloves. Oh no! What I didn't realize is that the nitrile gloves will get absolutely destroyed by the still warm phenol, and when I finally got to the cleanup, I had to wash off the disintegrated pieces of gloves off of my hands. Always, always, always check the glove compatibility if you're not sure. If I did it barehanded, I would at least know it's wet and stopped immediately. Instead, I had to deal with my hands reeking of phenol and skin being super dry because of the ethanol I used to wash the phenol and glove pieces off. Also, a fun idea if you have no idea what to get as a wedding gift for molecular bio-researchers. The reason we make our own phenol solutions is my PI got 40 kilos of super high purity phenol as a wedding gift from his former boss in a reagent supply company. It works much better than the premixes you can buy nowadays, especially for our own optimized protocols. So the thing here about phenol is, while it can be used to sterilize wounds and stuff, it's also used to kill the nail bed of nails. So I'm a little bit skeptical that it's safe to just get on your hands like this. Also, if it's a solution in chloroform, here you said it's in the more dense layer, so that, to me, means that it's in chloroform. You definitely don't want to get chloroform all over your hands either. So it's definitely good that you're wearing gloves, but you should definitely check the glove compatibility if you're not sure. I did some work with americium-241 sources a few years ago, and in the course of doing the safety risk assessment document, I found a US safety report about someone who had swallowed one and fortunately lived to tell the tale. Oh my gosh. <laughs> americium-241 is expensive, $1,500 a gram, so the source foil is actually an alloy of americium-241 with gold rolled out very thin and plated with silver on one side and palladium on the other. And thanks to that fact, you can roll metal foils really thin and a single source costs less than a dollar. I'm surprised to hear that an americium-241 source is actually relatively cheap. Very interesting. 
I made a necklace out of one gram of praseodymium metal, and the seller said it would last a weekend before corroding away. It's lasted five months despite being worn almost every day, getting soaked in a thunderstorm multiple times, going through the laundry, and being stuck in the wardrobe for two weeks or more. I might need to get a new string, as that will probably fail before the metal, which has a supernatural will to live at this point, for a reactive lanthanide. I also made a much bigger pendant out of ytterbium, which has held up pretty well for four years, though I take better care of it than the praseodymium. Lanthanides are underrated. I would be skeptical to make necklaces out of exotic metals. If you know that there's a good precedent for their use, then maybe that's okay. But you probably know a little bit more about this than I do. Also, I just want to mention you have a really awesome profile picture. If your profile picture is made out of gallium, that's absolutely legendary. One day in a high school chem class, we were studying your typical reactions of metals with acids. In the fume hood was a bottle of some hypophosphorous acid, which my dumb 18-year-old brain thought was just some spicy phosphoric acid since I'd never come across such a reagent at the time. Me and my lab partner decided it would be a good idea to add a bunch of it to a couple of grams of zinc powder that we had to do the experiments with, and we thought that the reaction was giving off hydrogen gas, because their syllabus strictly said, metal plus acid equals salt plus hydrogen. A few minutes go by of this mixture bubbling away, until our lab supervisor sees the bottle of hypophosphorous acid and the violently frothing mixture, and turns purple, before putting the test tube holder at the very back of the fume hood and slamming it in shut. The fume hood remained untouched for the best part of a month while the mixture was still in there. And after a bit of googling what had happened, I quickly discovered that the reaction didn't produce hydrogen, but instead was essentially a phosphine gas generator, which scared the living daylights out of myself and my lab partner. Yeah, that's pretty scary. That's a pretty scary one. Zinc is a reductant, hypophosphorous acid is phosphorus containing, and I guess it's possible to reduce that all the way to phosphine gas. Definitely a sketchy one. The moral of the story is, never work with spicy reagents until you've carefully thought out what the product of such a reaction could be. Instead of being a flammable gas, it was a horrifically toxic abomination, which with our high school chem knowledge we were completely ill-equipped to deal with. Please respect the reagents you work with and carefully assess the risks before mixing anything, since things could have gone very badly very quickly that day. Myself and 10 others in that lab are lucky to be alive. Chemistry is no joke and I have learned to give chemicals the proper respect that they deserve. Edit. Our PPE was a hoodie, some nitrile gloves, and a pair of lab goggles old enough for me to call them grandpa. I'm glad you guys made it out okay. It's definitely a sketchy one. I love how chemists can just casually mention, I've made hydrogen cyanide by accident before, and then move on like they didn't just talk about accidentally producing an extremely dangerous gas, and as a result, were likely separated from certain and very uncomfortable death by only a few centimeters and a pane of perspex. There's a lot of hazardous stuff we work with in the chemistry lab. It just kind of goes without saying that we work with a lot of really toxic stuff on a daily basis. I think I do a pretty good job of highlighting the risks associated with a lot of areas of chemistry, and I think that it's a trend that other chemistry YouTubers should adopt as well. Be safe. Two years ago, when I was a grade 12 student, I accidentally dropped a full bottle of phosphorus pentachloride in my home lab. Luckily, it was in a sealed bag and didn't spill everywhere, so I decided to quench it using water as it was contaminated. Back then, I obviously didn't know how violently phosphorus pentachloride reacts with water, so I put on my not-so-airtight goggles and carried on just pouring water into the bag, which I had transferred into a big bucket. Then, foomp! It just exploded and released a whole bunch of HCl gas that filled the entire room. I rushed to get the respirator on, and brilliant me decided it was a good idea to continue. As time went on, my eyes slowly began to hurt, and I began coughing. But I didn't get out until the PCL5 was all gone, thinking I was okay. This is because the ventilation fan is not powerful enough to remove all of the HCl gas. When I got out of the lab, my mom noticed my eyes were red and said, Did you get anything in your eyes? I replied, No, I didn't. It was at this moment that I realized my eyes were just swimming in HCl gas for nearly 30 minutes. I rushed to the drain and washed my eyes for 30 minutes straight. Luckily, I recovered in two days and no permanent damage was dealt to my eyes. You are super duper lucky. We also have this amazing contribution. One of my school friends had a memorable way of describing PCL5. It wombles in water. I got a sample from the drilling rig in a one liter plastic bottle without comment. I opened it and took a whiff. Got a toothache right away. I closed the bottle and phoned them, asking them what they're doing and what they expect me to do. They were removing silicates at the formation with HF. They really didn't know what they were dealing with. Insane. I got the EBGBs. We didn't even have calcium ointment on hand, and the medic didn't have an injection to fight it. It goes through the skin and into the tissues, and it quickly reacts with calcium, causing heart failure. Plus it causes even more problems if you get beyond the heart thing. HF is no joke, it is one of the scariest chemicals I've ever worked with, and I've had to quench three moles of it before. HF is a terrifying chemical. HF has definitely earned the reputation that it has. This is the big story for today's episode. Interesting to see your comments regarding phosgene. During my PhD, I used phosgene constantly and would liquefy it to add to reaction mixes via an ice-jacketed addition funnel. The source of our phosgene was a cylinder that was closed off with a square nut. 
To crack open the cylinder, it required two people, one to hold the cylinder and one to open the valve with a huge adjustable spanner. Anywho, some junior PhD candidates were setting up to run a phosgene reaction in the overnight lab, so I was helping them. We condensed around 20 to 30 milliliters of liquid phosgene and it was placed into the ice jacketed dropping funnel. The junior guys set up the reaction and I was doing a final check. I noticed the ice back around the reaction flask was melting really fast, so I looked for the cause. It turns out that the junior had accidentally left the heater on the hot plate turned fully on. I pointed that out to him, so he loosened the clamp holding the reaction flask and lifted it out off the melting ice bath. As he went to move the ice bath of the very hot hot plate, his lab coat sleeve caught on the stopcock of the liquid phosgene filled addition funnel and pulled it out. The liquid phosgene, boiling point 8.3 degrees Celsius, deposited itself onto the now hot hot plate and instantly vaporized. Despite being in a fume hood, the phosgene flashed off and sprayed the junior and a second junior standing next to him. This is the scariest story ever. The two juniors then legged it out of the lab and sped down the corridor out the door to exit the building, throwing off the clothes that they had as they ran. In the meantime, I stayed in the lab and mistakenly opened the windows of the lab to get rid of the now gaseous phosgene, whilst holding my breath. Windows open, I exited the lab and stood by the door to prevent anyone entering. Big mistake, as the air inside the building was at a lower pressure than outside. So the phosgene was now being blown out of the lab into the corridor, through the gap around the door. As it was after hours, I thought that this was the best course of action, rather than sounding the alarm to evacuate the building. Big mistake. The head of school came by and stopped to chat with me, with phosgene streaming through the door. Luckily, he was standing away from the stream. Phosgene has an unusually pleasant odor that no one would expect from its structure. Anyway, the head of the school finishes his conversation and walks off. Back come the two juniors, now wearing significantly less clothing than they were originally wearing. Just how toxic is phosgene, they ask. Why don't you go up to the library and check then if you don't know, I say. This is before the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974 that came into effect for the universities in the United Kingdom. So off they go. 20 minutes later they are back. Holy crap, they say. You can breathe in a lethal dose and show no ill effects for several hours, and then drown in your own body fluids. The next morning the juniors rock up to work. One looks really pale. I ask him, so what's up with you? The reply was, I was watching the news at 10 and coughed. I didn't know whether to call for an ambulance, so I stayed awake until around 5 a.m. So several oopsies all around. Still, this was an era in which I believe was very Darwinian. Complete your PhD and stay alive and or with all of your fingers or other appendages, you earn your PhD. I'm really glad that we don't work with Phosgene in a laboratory context anymore. There might be some labs that do, but I hope that the number of labs that work with Phosgene is approaching zero. I'm amazed that they got out of this okay. Most of the stories I've heard involving Phosgene result in fatalities in almost every instance. Today's Yikes Awardee goes to Joe Mackey. When I was in the Navy, my ship was going through a reactor refuel, and I was restricted to the ship. We had our morning muster in the usual place, and halfway through roll call, someone made us aware that there was an unshielded reactor core off to our left. LOL, of course they said we should be fine. Still, it's been 20 plus years and no cancer yet. This is one of those things that scares me, that there's people that could be maintaining a nuclear reactor and just expose other people to unshielded radiation. This is terrifying. In the past, I used to work at swimming pools. Once a year, usually around Christmas, the pool shuts down for a few weeks so we can drain it and scrub it. The first thing we'd do after a pool was drained was to dump two 208 liter, 55 gallon, drums of hydrochloric acid. Afterwards, we'd rinse off the pool with a hose and then dump in many bottles of bleach. We'd hop down into the pool and scrub using sponges, scrub brushes, or whatever else, on our hands and knees wearing sandals or barefoot. Only some had gloves. There wasn't enough rubber boots for everyone either, and no one had a mask of any kind. We would spend a solid six to eight hours cleaning and scrubbing, but because it was an indoor pool, there was quite a bit of fumes from the HCL and the bleach. I'd get headaches or be a bit dizzy or nauseous at times, so I'd go outside to breathe some fresh air for five to ten minutes. I ended up with a few mild acid burns on my hands that were fine after a couple of days, but then my left foot, more specifically my big toe and the inner part, were burned quite a bit more. For the next couple of months, the skin was bright red, then dark red, then light red, and eventually healed up with no lasting damage. Although, my foot felt like it was constantly too hot or it had a burning feeling, and that lasted for almost a year, even after the redness faded. It's been a few years since, and everything turned out okay for me in the end. However, to this day, whenever I smell bleach, I feel quite sick, and sometimes violently gag, though that only lasts for a few seconds. I think this highlights the importance of having educational chemistry channels, because a lot of people go swimming, and the people who manage swimming pools need to make sure that they are not making a boatload of chlorine gas. There was even an incident a few years ago at the Sochi Olympics where somebody had added a bunch of bleach to a pool containing hydrogen peroxide. And what happens when you mix bleach and hydrogen peroxide? It makes a whole bunch of singlet oxygen. Yikes. One of my lab mates writes stuff like CDCL3 with 2% ATR. No one thinks twice about stealing it. The idea here is that if you want to like nab their deuterated solvent for NMR, 
you're not going to take it if there's some additive in it that might show up in your NMR. So what is ATR? The ATR is anti-theft reagent. They don't actually put anything in it. This is genius, and I suggest you try this out. Have a great day.